Today, I'm interviewing someone who had managed to do over $10 million in sales before turning 18. Dylan, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me. Your story is absolutely incredible, if not what unbelievable. So if anyone hasn't met you before, give us a little bit of rundown. Tell us about the story. Cool. First off, thank you for having me on. I started this whole journey about five, six years ago now. It was in December of 2017. Always had a passion for shoes and Yeezy specifically. I noticed every single time they would come out, they were selling for at least double their retail price. And I just wanted them for myself. So I'm like, if I can get one for myself and a few extras to sell, I can, you know, keep a little bit of profit, get my own pair and have some money left over. So that's kind of how it started. And from there, I wasn't taking it too seriously up until 2019. I would just get like Supreme. It was just like a little side hustle I'd do on my phone. And in 2020 is where the business really took off. That's when I got credit cards, Amex specifically. That's what completely changed the game for us. So I had some Bank of America card from when I first started that had like maybe like seven or 8,000 as the credit limit. And Amex gave us like 80,000 right off the bat. So I immediately 10 x how much I could spend. And from there, I pretty much 10 x my sales too. So we went from doing like probably 10k a month or something like that to 100k a month, like immediately, I was just buying a lot more stuff. And in early 2021 is when I kind of saw a decline of that business model, people were buying 1000s of Yeezys and making less than 10% on them. So a couple of my friends who I'd met selling like Air Forces, Air Maxes doing all like RA, OA stuff, they were starting up on Amazon. And they showed me Jungle Scouts sales estimator on the Nike Monarchs. And I was like, nobody's buying this shoe online. Like, what is this? And they showed me it was selling like 10,000 times a month. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm in the wrong vehicle here. Like, I need to switch over to Amazon. So I make my seller account. We split a Nike ungate for like $7,500. It was like five of us paying $1,500 each. I'm very thankful I did. That was the best money I ever spent. And we started by going to the outlets a lot. And Q4 2021 is when I started to do OA and kind of like understand how much potential there was in Amazon. We're only going for the everyday shoes that can sell on Amazon. When I kind of realized that, I was like, okay, how do I double down on this? So that's when I started looking into getting a warehouse. And for throughout 2021, we were pretty much doing everything from the house. We had storage units. We were going back and forth. It was just not fun to unbox stuff outside, bring it in the house. Like it was just a grind. So I start looking for a warehouse. We were in there for about a year and a half. And honestly, Honestly, it was fun, but it was not worth it. I wish I would have went all prep centers from the start. I really understood how a warehouse worked after that. So that helps me vet out prep centers in the future and see how the entire process worked. So I am glad for that experience. I don't really regret anything, but definitely from a financial standpoint, it would have been much cheaper to go all with prep centers because I was doing OA and I'm in a tax state. So a lot of the stuff that we were able to get, we did have tax exempt on, but only like 50%. The other 50% we were still paying tax on. But all the outlet stuff, we were able to get tax exempt on as well. But a lot of those online purchases, we were paying three, four, five dollars in sales tax on each pair of shoes, which is like so stupid because you could just pay a prep center two dollars and they'll prep shoes all day. I started to slow down on the shoes and started to do a little bit more wholesale, started to get into that probably about a year and a half ago now. And that was great. That it kind of opened me up to a whole different world of Amazon. Before we were doing pretty much 90% footwear. It was like all away, all footwear. And we were doing a lot of volume of it too. It's very easy to do a lot of revenue with shoes and you can do really well with it too. But if you're not dealing with those returns that come in, it stacks up and becomes like horrible. And that led us into starting wholesale. And at first I started with a lot of like the, the products that are very attractive for new sellers, like Dove, Colgate. That's the stuff that you see when you look up Amazon wholesale. What I realized is it's way too hard to compete in these areas. You're competing with sellers who have very good pricing, one, and two, very efficient warehouse operations where they're able to prep units for 10 cents, 5 cents, very, very cheap prices. And I was getting ready to move out of my warehouse at that point. So I was running the numbers with like a 80 cent or a dollar prep fee. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense at all. I can't sell these products. When I realized that I was like, okay, I need to change up my approach some and start looking at different categories. And that was the best thing I could have done. The more boring, the better. We're doing a lot of boring <laughs> products and not as many people are looking for stuff like that. Works out a lot better long term. Now we really only look at stuff that has like higher ASPs. Some stuff, obviously, like if the margin's there, like we're going to buy something that has a $15 ASP if I'm getting it for $3. Like just there's no reason not to if the margin's there. But the majority of the stuff that we're getting is higher ASP. I think our ASPs right now is 80 to 90, which is very high for wholesale. A lot of wholesale people I know are like 
20, 15 or lower. I've seen some in like 12 to $14 range. So we're trying to focus on the higher ASPs. That also really helps when it comes to these new fees that Amazon's adding, like the placement fees or the low level inventory fees. That $1 isn't really going to affect us like it's going to affect a seller who's buying something for $2, selling it for $9 and only making $1.50. That completely kills their margin. But for me, if I'm selling something for 90 and I'm making 20 bucks, it's like it's not really affecting us very much. Taking that approach has been really, really important important for us. And it also helps us scale up to bigger numbers without having as big of a skew count. And that transition from OA to wholesale has also been nice, like not really having to put in as much legwork when it comes to just manually OA sourcing, because I did all product research myself, I had some help on like the purchasing end, but like all of the leads were found by me. And that's still how it is to this day. My, my VA is just helping with like admin stuff and like making labels, stuff like that. He'll, he'll look through leads every once in a while. How old are you now? I'm I'm 18 still. Amex gave you a credit card when you were under 18. Is that right? No, you have to have a co-signed parent. But I was the only member on the LLC, which is, I don't really know how we got it open, but it happened. They, like, they just co-signed for me. I was under 18. I was the only member of the LLC, but it, it worked at the time. So you can have an LLC under the age of 18. Is that right? It's, it's state specific, which is interesting. Like certain states you can, certain ones you can't, but Georgia, you can. Oh, interesting. Cool. So obviously then you created the credit card on that and then started, then just continued. Once you've got access, access to credit and they start building a credit file, then it just goes through the roof, doesn't it? It's like, oh yeah, Amex give it to you, we'll give it to you. Yeah, we're fine. My God, you're 18 now. Wow, that's incredible. Absolutely blow my mind. That's the big thing that no one talks about is I started mm -hmm. with $1,000 and now I'm doing 10 million. It's a credit in the middle, which allows you to yeah. build, you know, it's, it's your ability to play the game. So absolutely yeah. amazing, like amazing. So you, sneakers, you're out of the game. Sneakers were good for you back then. Is it still a good place to start? What are your thoughts now? I honestly do think it's a good place to start, especially for the people who are coming from a sneaker background and you can make great money selling shoes as long as you're dealing with everything that comes with them. I think for the first like six months to a year, sneakers are great to start with. Just kind of understand the business, especially now with like all these new fees and stuff. It's a higher ASP thing. The returns obviously do cut into profit. You just need to make sure your margin's high enough to where it's not too much of the profit gone. But it is still a good place to start, especially at the Nike outlet. Like for us, that was where we started. It was super easy. Go in there, scan a bunch of stuff, walk out with 20 pairs of shoes shoes. And that's how I started. I still think that's how people should start today. It's just an easy way to do it. ASP, if anyone doesn't know, what does that mean? Uh, average sale price. So this is the price that we buy at or the price we sell it at? Selling price. Fantastic. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Sneakers are great because they're really high ASP. You talked about controlling your margins, like getting good margins. Like, Give us an idea of margin. What should people be aiming for in this? Yeah. So for sneakers, ROI wise, I would say like 30 to 40% is like a minimum now. I used to take 28, 30%, but it's just like a little bit slim depending on the product. Some models would be good at that price because they'd be only 8% or 9% return rate. Some would be not even profitable at 28% ROI because it was like 20% return rate. And what we realized is the shoes that are more expensive always had a higher return rate. So like Hoka, OnCloud, all those types of shoes always were like ridiculously high return rates for us. We cut those out of our business pretty quick. Like we were mainly doing Nike and Converse. And the sweet spot was like 60 to $80. That's the sale price. And that I feel like doesn't get a lot of returns. And it's not too cheap to where you're like not making a great profit margin, but it's to the price where people don't really feel like they have to return it if it doesn't fit them. But it's not like too cheap to where like I'm only making seven bucks a shoe. So I'm able to make like 15 a pair. And it's also not the highest return rate for that range. We found the return rate to be like 10 to 12%. And that was okay with us as long as we're making 30% ROI or more. Now with wholesale, it's a little bit different. It's pretty product dependent. Some stuff we've taken 20% on and been very happy with that if it moves really quick and there's no real returns or anything like that. And other things like oversized stuff or stuff that has slightly higher return rate, we want to get at least like 28 to 30, but it's very product dependent. Usually 22 to 25 is like the minimum. You talked about it earlier on, you got a warehouse and then you said, actually, I wish I'd done prep. Tell mm -hmm. me like prep costs. Like if you're looking at sneakers, like what should you be looking at and what kind of advice? I know you talked about like tax-free states 
shoes. Tell me about that. The only place I would get a prep center for if you're doing shoes is like Delaware or New Hampshire because Oregon is okay. I say Delaware and New Hampshire because those are tax exempt on everything. There's no sales tax at all there. Jersey's good because there's tax on some items, but there's no tax on clothing and shoes. Prep centers will go a little bit cheaper on the rates there. The ones that are in like Delaware like to go a little bit more expensive because it is tax free on everything. So it's good to have one set up in Delaware, one set up in Jersey. That's the personal setup I have. I have a prep center in Oregon too for really only West Coast wholesale. Like if I have something in California, it doesn't make sense to have it shipped all the way across the country to New Jersey. It's just, it has to go to the West Coast. Pricing wise for standard units, OA, I think like $1 is good. For shoes, it's going to be higher. It's going to be like $1.50. In that range, if you're like plus or minus 50 cents of that, you're good. I would say $2 is like a good cap for shoes on what to pay. Having it in the Northeast, I think is very important because one, most of the retailers like Foot Locker, all of them, they're all based in either like PA, New Jersey, New York. Like that's where they're going to be shipping a lot of the product from. So it's going to get to your prep center very quickly. And uh, two, there's a lot of Amazon fulfillment centers in like New Jersey, in that area. You're going to only be shipping it like an hour drive away. It's going to check in a lot quicker. And those fulfillment centers, in my experience, are much more reliable than like the West Coast ones or some of the smaller ones. When we're shipping all of our product to like, like the three, I think of like TEB9, ABE8, and CLT4. Those are like the big ones that we ship to over the years. And even during like crazy Q4 and all that stuff, they still are pretty solid about the check-ins. The check-ins only get slow when it's like a smaller fulfillment center. Whenever we ship to those big main ones, usually good on check-in times. It's overall a very quick process. And that's pretty much it when it comes to prep centers. You need to make sure you're communicating with them a lot. I think the big thing behind the prep center when you're looking at one is that everyone looks at the prices. I'm like, no, the number one thing is they actually don't lose stock and they actually do what they say yep. they're going to do. Like, yep. it doesn't matter how cheap it is. If they lose stock, you've lost way more money than the price you saved on the cheapness. And another thing too, I'm glad you mentioned that. The prep fee, I only work with prep centers that have like flat prep fees. We've worked with some in the past where it's like 70 cents for FN SKU, 30 cents for a poly bag, 50, so like all these little tiny fees, like boxes, tapes, supplies. There's one prep center we opened up an account with. I was expecting, like we opened it up, it's supposed to be 70 cents. It ended up being like over $2 a unit. I'm like, this is just ridiculous because and I, I want to have very transparent pricing here. So I know what to put into like sell ramp and all these different tools. I need to know it's like, okay, this is a dollar flat right here. And then maybe an extra charge every once in a while if it's like a specialized receiving or something so like doing returns or something like that. But for just like a traditional standard item, I want it to be the same price every single time. I don't want there to be a lot of variables in that. So I think a lot of people get taken advantage of by prep centers that have all these like tiny little fees and it just like sneaks up on people without them really realizing it. Agreed. And they're, they're looking at the headline rate, the 70 cents. They're like, wow, that's better than the $1. And I'm like, no, like you're going to get $2 once you capture it all in. And you're <laughs> yeah. like, wow, I shouldn't have done that. And it happens. I've seen it. I've seen it too many times. And not that, even myself, I've seen it where we've gone with a cheaper one when we first opened the US, shipped all the Q4 stock in. They didn't ship it out until January. I was like, Oh, that's right. I want to kill you. Yeah. So yeah. again, it's even like if they, they've got, it doesn't matter the price if they can't. And the problem, we noticed it because they weren't like, well, we're going to be limiting the amount of people. They were like, no, we'll take everyone. We'll take everyone, which is an immediate red flag because yeah. prep centers can only handle a few clients every month and like onboard them. You've achieved $10 million in sales which is incredible. How do you structure your time? Tell me about that. What do you do? I think it all starts like just the entrepreneurship and work ethic. It all starts from my parents. They both are entrepreneurs. They both have their own companies. And that really kind of bled down to me and opening my eyes to being able to create my own path and not having to go to college or go work for a nine to five, something like that. So that just kind of like instilled that that was possible to me. They've also never really like cracked down on what I was doing. Like if I wanted to try a new sport, something like that, they'll let me go for it. They'll let me do it. They and they'll open up a bank account for me if I need help with that. So little things like that, it kind of like opened up the path along the way. And it's honestly just a passion for making progress and having fun while doing it. I usually take one day off a week, which is pretty much always Sunday. I'll still usually do like at least an hour worth of work, just like responding to messages, stuff like that. And during the week, usually wake up around like 8.39, pretty much work for most of the day. I'll have lunch around like 12 workout sometime either in the morning before lunch or later in the afternoon, like around five, like before I hopped on this to hit a little weight lift and ran a little bit. 
that I've been doing for the past about four months or so. That's I really, really enjoy. It helps like keep me kind of clear throughout the day. If you sit on your computer for 10 hours and just stare at your screen all day and like maybe take one break to eat, you're not going to be very efficient by hour eight or hour six even. Because you're not going to be working at the same pace as you were at hour one through three. Taking something to kind of like split that up, still doing something productive, maybe if it's not helping the business directly, but it's still helping me as a person. So having that split throughout kind of the day really helps. I'll usually work till about seven or eight and then get dinner. After dinner kind of depends. Maybe I'll hang out with friends. Maybe I'll chill for the night, watch a movie with my parents. That usually how my day looks like Monday through Sunday. You're not doing insane hours. Like you're not waking up at 5.30, 4.30 in the morning and working till 10 o'clock every night and like doing crazy. Like it seems kind of reasonable and you're even doing exercise and like other bits well done. Admittedly, the, the kind of bit more crazy is like you're working Saturday, but that's not like that crazy. But like, what is it that you're doing in your time? I'm, are you like super intentional? Do you have very clear goals about what you want to achieve? Is there anything which you notice that you do that maybe other people who you've networked with don't do, or maybe they do and like, that's why you're successful? What kind of habits can you, have you formed that other people can take away from this? Yeah, so I have been pretty direct about my work recently. So I use monday.com now. I've been liking that a lot. And it's basically just like a to-do list, a little bit fancier version of it. And having that makes me a lot more efficient because I got a lot of stuff going on, thinking about a lot of stuff. Like maybe I need to respond or schedule a podcast or something. I'll just throw that into the uh, to-do list on my phone on monday.com. And it just kind of keeps that there for me. And then I'll get on my computer starting the day for that first three hours. I'm just knocking out every single thing on that list. So I think doing that has really helped me. And I started that in the past like four months or so. So that's been pretty recent. You're in wholesale now. Tell us about that. Tell us about the tips and tricks that you've learned. Like you've transitioned through absolutely smashing it. Tell me about wholesale. Like what kind of tips and tricks can you share for people on your journey from that? that learning. First tip, my favorite way of opening up new accounts or just like meeting distributors or brands is going to be trade shows. Meeting them face to face takes you so much further than just an email or a phone call. That has been huge for us. A lot of our big accounts are like two of our three like main accounts. We met at trade shows. Being able to just put yourself out there and go to those events, really, really important. Two, you need to be approaching them as a professional, especially at trade shows. They get hundreds of people approaching them and like big distributors online, literally like 30 50 calls a day like hey we sell products on Amazon we're looking to get a catalog they're throwing you in the trash <laughs> like they don't want to hear that they hear that all day they know you're not a serious customer coming off as like a professional retailer having a nice website having a domain email and going to those distributors knowing what you want that is like the number one thing that has taken us far in wholesale and allows them to take you seriously if you go up to a wholesaler and the first thing you say is like hey nice to meet you I'm Dylan from Sawyer Sales and Distribution and we're looking to buy 500 of these at this price. Are you able to make that happen? And it just kind of puts them on the spot. And they're like, okay, yeah, we're ready to do business right here, right now. Let's do it. Doing that much easier than getting catalogs and trying to, you know, run it through a UPC scanner or have VAs go through that. Like having a more targeted approach on certain brands or products has been really, really important to us. And also just focusing on the more boring side of things, not going to the flashy, like the Dove or whatever, like that stuff and going for like, like industrial tools, stuff like that has done really, really well for us. Final question for you. You said you got a VA, like your team. Is it one VA or is it like an army of VAs? It's just one right now. And he's mainly just doing admin work. I talk to him a lot now. When I first started, I wasn't talking to him enough. Now I'm messaging back and forth or hopping on call with him like pretty much all day throughout the day. Little things like if if it's going to take me 15 minutes to put these orders in a spreadsheet, I'm sending it to him. Little things like that just to kind of take that off my plate and have me focused on what's really, really important. My philosophy is I've learned this from some eight figure sellers that I've met throughout this journey. The most important parts of the business are sourcing one and repricing two. Those are kind of interchangeable, but those are the most important parts of the business. So start by outsourcing everything else. So when I kind of thought about it in that way, I'm like, okay, let me start with operation side of things like making labels, doing stuff like that. I need to outsource all of that and focus all of my time or as much of my time as possible on those two things, sourcing and repricing. I'm following someone right now who is all about buying back your time. Like all these 
little like 15 minutes here, little 15 minutes there. They you know, get rid of them, focus on the stuff which makes you money, and then hire people to do the stuff which just is not adding value. Because you only have 24 hours yep. a day. And there's a reason why people can achieve way more with this doing, ironically, less work, for example. So I think that's incredible. So question for you, what does the future hold? Where are you going? Definitely looking to scale up the wholesale side of things and get more into brand direct. I've done a lot of business with distributors. We don't really have many big brand direct accounts. Looking to be the best path to go when it comes to Amazon. Also looking to get into private label as well. Being able to be an approved seller, like not being unauthorized is huge. Like if the brand knows that you're selling their products and they're like totally cool with it, like you have a letter of authorization, you're sourcing straight from the brand, cuts out so many of the risks that come with Amazon. Section three doesn't matter at that point. Brand reviews don't matter at that point. You have brand direct invoices. It doesn't matter whatever they throw at you. Any authenticity complaints, gone immediately. You don't have to worry about that type of stuff when you're doing brand direct. And same with private label when you're controlling the entire process of it. Private label is a lot more upside than OA wholesale. You can exit the company, but it is riskier and it is harder to do. There's a reason why a lot of people start Amazon, start PL and fail. And then a lot of them come back, start OA again. So it makes sense to do that progression of OA or like RAOA, then wholesale, then PL, which is what I plan on doing. And then also continuing to grow the personal brand, share my story and doing that as well. First things first, well done. Blown my mind of what you've achieved. Number two, thank you for coming on today and sharing from not only myself, but also everyone watching. And honestly, I can't wait to see where you're going to be in the next year. Mind blown already. I cannot wait. But for myself and everyone, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, Tom.